And we would like to uh, resume uh, the different uh, discussions that we had in a final international panel discussion and the Q&A. We would like to answer the question, how can transformative policies, transformative health systems and transformative communities relate to each other? And how can the global health movement contribute to the climate movement? A general questions, but I'm sure that uh, Karel Geisling, as a moderator, will be able to tackle that question with the people he invited to talk with him. Karel Geisling, are you there? Yes, I'm there, Annabel, and I will try to do my best to respond to your questions. Uh, welcome to you all, and uh, welcome to this uh, well, this final panel debate. Um, this panel brings together uh, five women from different backgrounds, different uh, perspectives, different disciplines uh, in the fight on, on climate change. Uh, and it's exactly this diversity uh, we need uh, when tackling such a planetary uh, challenge. I'm sure the answer will, uh, would approve, as we said yesterday. So um, let me introduce the, uh, the panelists. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Adaïde Charlier, who is um, one of the founding members of Youth for Climate and who is also present, uh, who took the train, I guess, to Glasgow for the COP26 and who is one uh, of, the, of the advisors of, of uh, uh, Franz Demmermann. Uh, welcome, Adelaide. And then we have also uh, Virginia, Virginia Talents from, from the Philippines. She is from the Climate Change Network from, for Community Initiatives, a strong advocate. Uh, she told me she has also a nickname, Jean, eh, but we can't, we can't disclose that now. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Virginia. Um, and then uh, we have Ka uh, Karin, Karin Thibault from uh, the Climate Coalition Greenpeace. Uh, welcome, Karin, to, to, to the panel. Uh, just as Elise van Bellen, who is uh, uh, the director from Mimisa and also the chair of, of Because Health. And finally, we have Elham Yusifian from the International Dis Disability Alliance. And welcome to you all. Normally, we would have been in comfortable chairs wobbling around uh, in, in some room in Antwerp, but unfortunately, it's not possible. So, uh, But please continue to wobble on your own chairs back, back home. Um, but let's start uh, immediately. Uh, we just heard um, Mike Ryan. Um, is there any one of you who wants to briefly react on it, uh, give a, an impression, something you, which stroke you or what you, you want to share with the audience? Or it was such a such a clear message, actually, of course, and, and uh, that we don't have to react now. What we can do this later in the debate, of course. Um, if, I, if I may comment, my only reaction was that then he, he, the message was mentioning the groups that need to be considered mentioned women, young person and the indigenous person, but I think they missed to mention persons with disabilities. So I just wanna take this opportunity to ask that because we are 15% of the world population and it is important that climate action when trans commitments on disability are still missing. So if in other uh, situations we have commitments that need to be turned to action for inclusion of persons with disabilities, we also need commitments. So just wanted to raise that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alham, for this uh, contribution, for this precision. Someone else who likes to say something? Uh, I see that the very emphasis on focusing work in communities with limited resources, listening to people and making them part of the solution is uh, very crucial in any form of climate action that we will suggest or plan. That's all, that's my reaction. Thank you very much, Virginia. Thank you very much. Someone else? Okay. Well, um, you can always react in the course of this debate uh, even further on my crying, but I, I think uh, we have some, uh, as Annabel suggested, uh, uh, today we discussed on, the focus was on action yesterday, on impact today on, on action uh, and on transformative action, uh, uh, whether at the level of communities, uh, policy level, uh, health system level. 
Um, so I, I would like to, to address the first question to, to Karine. I will do it in French. Uh, Karine, uh, comment pouvons-nous mettre la santé d'une façon plus... How could we put the health at the agenda of the climate movement in a more, uh, in a stronger way? Good uh, morning, everyone. I represent uh, the Climate um, Coalition, 90 organizations among which mutuality, so that working, working on health and mutualities because they understood that the climate um, change, the global warming will have an impact on people's health, people's health and uh, health system. I'm sure you've talked about that, but we are talking about the cumulated impact on people, on premature death, on uh, epidemics and um, diseases, on extreme weather events, but also on the a fragile health system in poorest countries of the planet, which will find itself in an even more complex situation in the years to come. And the central question, and I may take a, a, a deviation, the key question is our capacity as a humanity is to reduce us uh, greenhouse gas emission and then reduce climate change and then reduce extreme weather conditions and extreme uh, disasters. Um, I agree with Adelaide that we uh, realized that we had to mitigate to 1.5 degree increase, but unfortunately, the opportunity window is shrinking. We are already at 1.1 degrees. So what can we do in the 10 years ahead in order not to go beyond that uh, threshold? Because if we go beyond that critical threshold, even now, we know that the future generation and our generation will suffer very clearly the climate change effect. But if we go beyond 1.5 degrees, the multiplication of extreme weather events will be major and even more so in uh, countries of the south. One of the challenges, I think, between a very large climate movement and um, NGOs like Greenpeace or Health organizations are to name the problem, to name the threshold we should not go beyond, to fight in order to not go beyond that threshold and to name the causes. And that was a major fight during um, uh, COP26, is the elephant in the room. It's uh, the energy. For those who, who followed uh, COP26, it was very difficult to the very end we obtained a mention for the very first time in a text about climate, a mention for decreasing coal and the way out to fossil energy, and uh, it was the very first time. So there is a synergy is to, uh, between health movement and climate movement is the cause between climate change and um, fossil fuel. So I'm talking here about um, oil, gas, and coal. And there are possibilities to reduce, on the one hand, in order to reduce greenhouse gas uh, effects, but also combustion of fossil fuel. We will have an effect on air pollution and on climate change. That is something that was mentioned. I did not attend the both full days, but and, um, air pollution creates 8.8 .8 million premature deaths a year. It's huge, and you can see that in all major cities of Europe and, and, and cities of the South, in, in India, in China. Uh, you can see the effect on premature death and the effect on uh, children's health. So I think something may be even stronger in the years ahead. In COPS, we can see that health professionals are making relationship with the air pollution, uh, climate change and effect on health. But I'm sure we must go uh, further. We should mobilize even more health professional, health organization in relationship with the um, uh, climate movement because it's uh, the challenge of the century. And then we need to think about the holistic approach of health, not just fighting against uh, disease uh, and uh, epidemics. It's uh, the general well-being. That's what it's all about. 
if we are able in the years ahead to reduce greenhouse gas effect emission. If we are uh, able to reduce air pollution, we will increase the general well-being of the population and the well-being and climate change issues are both related and I'm sure this will allow more people to understand that fighting against climate change is to fight for a more a global well-being. There are two very uh, interesting elements, forced to uh, gather more and more health organizations to join the uh, climate coalition, be it in Belgium or elsewhere, because it allows to uh, highlight uh, health issues in climate uh, questions. Of course, the well-being uh, issue uh, in an holistic way, uh, mental well-being, physical well-being, and resilient health system. Uh, so this is something that should be brought about in climate negotiation and in issues that are developed at national level. The be there are the National Plan for Energy and Climate. I'm not going to go much further because uh, I think I've gone beyond my uh, speech time. Well, thank you. It was excellent. Thank you, Karine. We're talking about this this holistic approach eh? and well-being, mental health, and I think um, yesterday we didn't hear uh, too much about it, but but the, Today, we really heard a lot about it, and that was, was really, really nice. But I would ask uh, uh, Elham to, to, to a bit uh, go deeper in, in, into that. Eh? And, and from your perspective, um, can you uh, share a bit your, your point of view on the link between climate change and, and uh, mental health, but uh, maybe also disabilities in, in, in general? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I hope my voice is clear enough for Perfect. everybody. Thank you. So, um, of course, climate change has very, very serious mental health consequences, uh, as was mentioned. So, uh, first of all, uh, the climate anxiety, uh, which uh, is more or less for everybody, but certain groups experience that, that more than others, including uh, youth, who don't know, we are all talking about like what would happen to the earth in 20 years, in 30 years, and that's exactly their future. So this group has specifically uh, experienced the anxiety and also uh, groups live in poverty in specific areas that are more uh, susceptible to uh, climate called uh, disaster, cause disasters. And, uh, you know, they expect, uh, experience extra challenges and extra mental health uh, consequences. And also uh, people with disabilities. In this group, we also have people who have mental health condition. For, so, for example, with someone who has already underlying mental health uh, condition, um, climate anxiety would be uh, doubled or tripled and they will experience more consequences. So what we need is that governments consider clim uh, mental health in their climate adaptation uh, policies. So for example, when they're introducing uh, policies and programs to address consequences of climate change on health, they need to consider mental health consequences. And they also need to consider specific needs for specific groups. So for example, um, uh, when they are uh, introducing uh, programs to provide additional mental health support, they need to consider that these programs need to be accessible for everyone. So let's imagine someone who is deaf uh, and lives in a, a climate uh, vulnerable area, very close to a big ocean where uh, sea rates is very serious. So this person, First of all, let's, let's uh, draw the picture of the life of that person. This person doesn't have information about what's happening. Why? Because the information about that should be provided in sign language so a deaf person can understand. But unfortunately, we face the reality, the sad reality that in most situations, the information about climate change and what we are doing and what we can do and what would be happen what would be happening is not provided in accessible format for different groups. So this deaf person is not able to uh, follow uh, the, the up-to-date information. So they don't know what's happening. They don't know what they can do and they don't know what they should do if a disaster happens. 
So that person experienced more anxiety, more mental health uh, consequences of climate. And if they need help for that, they cannot access it because they cannot, uh, most of the psychosocial support consultation processes are not accessible for that person again because of the language barrier, because of the sign language is not provided. So I think you cannot all imagine the situation of this person who experiences more anxiety and has less, <clears throat> less way, uh, less means to access support and is very little included in any programs. Now, let's imagine that the disaster is happening, again, going to the situation of this deaf person. Uh, most of the time, uh, the, um, when the disasters happen, the evacuation, the support is not inclusive of different groups. So this uh, person doesn't know where to go. So imagine there's a heat wave in the country or there is a, a cold wave in the country or there is a flood coming. The person doesn't know what exactly they should do right now. So we recently had a report published, for example, with, uh, by Human Rights Watch on the uh, experience of per old persons and uh, older persons and persons with disabilities in the heat wave that they had this summer in British Columbia, Canada. So we're not talking about a developing or least developed country. We are talking about a developed country, right? We are talking about Canada. But still, if you look at that report and if you can just Google Human Rights Watch report on uh, heat wave in Canada on persons with disabilities, you will see what happened to people. So they didn't uh, access the help. They, many of them lost their lives, uh, faced health consequences of that. And even like the programs that the government introduced to support people were not accessible. So they, in, in, for example, they created cooling centers, but people couldn't go to these cooling centers because of accessibility barriers, because of navigation barriers. So uh, again, this group are experiencing more and more when the adaptation happens. And finally, I wanna wrap up by mentioning the contribution of persons with disabilities, uh, including persons with mental health conditions in climate battle. This is a battle for everyone. So everyone should be able to play a role. And I don't think that we are in a situation to miss anyone. Everybody should have the opportunity to play our roles in climate mitigation. Uh, but unfortunately, because climate mitigation policies and programs are not designed with consultation with persons with disabilities and their representative organizations, we always face the reality that persons with disabilities cannot play the role they want and they should in climate uh, battle and in battling climate crisis. Uh, so, if I want to wrap up, my final point would be to consult, to go to persons with disabilities, especially to their representative organization. And by representative organization, we mean organizations established by persons with disabilities themselves and governed by persons with disabilities themselves and working for inclusion of persons with disabilities and disability rights. Um, so the International Disability Alliance, where I work, is the global network of over 1,200 organizations of persons with disabilities. We bring together organizations from all regions, all different groups of persons with disabilities. We have uh, persons who are deaf uh, representing in our board. We have uh, persons who are blind, intellectual disabilities, persons with mental health conditions, and all of them have come, to get, come together to establish the Alliance. So my, uh, if you take away one thing from this uh, meeting, would be to reach out to persons with disabilities and their representative organizations from the very beginning of planning and ask us how you can include us and how we can contribute in ensuring that any policies and programs you are putting in place to ensure health during the climate crisis is inclusive of and accessible to persons with disabilities. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you for this message, Elham. It's a nice message on inclusion. Thank you very much. Um, I propose we go back to 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 Glasgow, eh? uh, but to Adelaide. Eh? Um, Adelaide, yes, you have uh, in life you have uh, bad cops and good cops. Uh, what do you think of uh, COP twenty six? Is it a bad or a good cop? How much <laughs> points would they get on ten? <laughs> 
it's crazy. The student here can be the teacher of uh, the world leaders. I love it. Um, I would give it a pretty bad grade. It probably failed the exam uh, for the simple reason that, like Karin already mentioned earlier, yes, for once we heard, uh, finally, uh, we talked about fossil fuel, which is, like Karin said, the big elephant in the room that we never dare to talk about. But in the last minute, we did reduce the or change the words that just meant everything and meant that by the end of the day, we actually will not really change too much because it would mean that it's too much work. So this cup was clearly a failure if we talk about the urgency. Today, our world leaders and still too many citizens do not understand the urgency behind climate change. And that's what I want to link it here with health that I don't think I need to repeat what is the link between climate change and health, except that when we talk about climate change, we talk about the death of people. We talk about the life of people. We talk about the way they're going to keep living. And we talk about two specific groups, as I see it. People today that are already touched by the consequences of climate change, because it's not a question for the next generation, and the youth life. Because for us, and for me, as a young privileged woman from Europe, I am not yet directly touched by the consequences of climate change, which is a privilege, but I will be. And many people already are. And this is what we have to start understanding today, that every of our actions on our everyday life here, maybe especially in the Western life, have an impact on the health of many other citizens across the world and will have an impact on the health of the next generation and already of the children that are here present in the Western societies. So we have to be able to question everything we are doing. And that's why it's hard. And that's probably why we will never have the solution coming out of a cup. Because coming out of the cup, we will never dare to question every single thing in our life and every single action we are doing. So going back on trying to answer the question, two things that failed at COP26. First of all, we did not reach the budget to help um, vulnerable countries already uh, touched by the consequences of climate change to be able to adapt and have a budget to adapt, but also to reach their, um, their targets of climate neutrality. So that target was supposed to, or that, that bird budget, sorry, was supposed to already be reached in 2020. We are in 2021. So that means that the student failed because it's one year later to, in that, to hand in their work and they don't even hand in a full work. So it's not okay. And then second of all, we talk about coal, but we talk about slowly, you know, reducing the coal. And finally, we talk about stopping subsidies of fossil fuel, which should have been done a long time ago, and which should have been written immediately as soon as we get out of this cup. So yes, of course, this is a failure because we do not get out of this cup with the idea that every single country of this world will take their responsibility in the country, in the arrest, in their uh, causes to uh, the, the urgency of climate change. I think here the main message for me is to say that we are not taking seriously the destruction of humanity. We are not taking seriously our health because we do not want to see the biggest danger that the system we have put in place has on us, on our species and on every other single species living on this planet. We have decided, but mainly in the West societies, because that's where I have been born and raised, that humans are not linked to nature and that we are separated. And that is not okay because actually we have gained that from nature. We are who we are thanks to that and we are linked. And it would be crazy to not see the link between everything that surrounds us in our everyday life, even in Western societies as nature. And so I think there is so many things that we have to re-question, but Again, I want to insist, it will not come out, out of a COP26. It will not come out of a COP. We need to be able to listen to people who already are affected by the consequences of climate change and people who are, have lived for years and years and generations on this planet and do not destroy everything around them. And I'm talking also about listening to, for example, indigenous communities who have many solutions and are also experts 
So coming out of this cup, what I will remember is that I shall listen more and put in place and put forward more the voices of people who are already touched and who have solutions because there are many other experts in this world that we don't invite enough to listen to. Thank you very much, Adelaide, for this uh, strong message of, of a sense of urgency and also uh, giving the voice to the to the local uh, communities everywhere in the world. Thank you very much for for that. Um, the organizers say we have uh, um, we have a bit of, we get a bonus of, of five or ten minutes, so we have until 10, 10 past five, so still seven minutes. So I would like to to ask Elise uh, if you hear all this as as the chair of Because Health. Uh, how how can because health and 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 its global health community contribute to this um, well the fight against climate change? What can we do in practice? Thank you, Cara. Well, because health is a network, and a network um, the strength of a network depends on on its members. So uh, I would say everything is possible as uh, if uh, if there are people who want to do it. Um, the, the members are, as I said uh, before, very various. Eh? It's all uh, Belgian organizations, individuals and their partners who uh, come together uh, with the same objective to improve access to quality health care uh, worldwide. So that's a very large objective. But the strength of the network is that there are so uh, the members come from different backgrounds. You have uh, NGOs uh, from bilateral agencies, ac academics, universities, diaspora, and uh, interested individuals that relate to this objective. So it gives a lot of possibilities um, because health works mostly with working groups. So the first uh, thing I think, and uh, it was already mentioned several times, I think there is a a lot of willingness is to have a specific working group on climate change and health, uh, which will emerge from this conference and uh, and um, uh, which can be uh, in, in which everybody who's interested uh, can contribute. Uh, the, the, the objective of a working group is, is not to have a working group on itself, but again, it comes because different people uh, uh, feel that they have a, a common goal and that they want to exchange on it. Uh, to learn, uh, to to find problems, uh, to find solutions to problems, and find new problems so we can solve them again. Uh, so this, I think, is is a first thing. Uh, but uh, not only a new working group. I think uh, it's also a thematic that can be integrated into the existing working groups uh, because it is uh, very transversal and. Um, I think now very clear to everyone how it is not only an emergency, but also uh, it's it's more, it's through all sectors. It's uh, in in uh, everything we do that there 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 are uh, elements uh, to be taken into account. So the working group, for example, mental health could uh, integrate uh, specific recommendations also from this conference, but uh, linked to everything that is. Uh, uh, going on around us, the working group on SRHR medicines to give a few examples of existing working groups. Um, and then as a network, I think um, we can also reach out to other networks more than we already do, to other networks or to other sectors. We have good examples in the past. Um, we organized uh, a couple of years ago a conference together with Educate. Uh, uh, and, um, Carol, you uh, you were uh, at, at that time very involved. So this this I think was a very good experience to see how we can uh, not only stay within our own uh, sector and within our own health objectives, but um, reach out to others. And and it's been said various times now, also in this conference, uh, that we we don't work together enough. And it doesn't come naturally. Uh, well, everybody seems to to think, or there there seems to often uh, be a, a first tendency to know that oh, we know we know what we do, and and we do it our way, and our expertise within our specific sector uh, will bring us the solutions. But I think it's more and more clear, and also uh, there's more and more awareness and willingness to actually uh, have a much more multi-sector approach. It doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, it doesn't mean it, it will change tomorrow, but I think uh, this awareness and this willingness is the first thing. 
Um, for example, also when we organized the conference on urban health, AU, we, we, we reached out to urban planners, we to engineers, we started looking at other aspects related to health to, um, to, to include in, in the reflection. And this is very enriching. And I think because health can play an important role uh, in facilitating this towards its members uh, and, and in reaching out to, well, in Belgium, but in Europe, but worldwide, to other existing uh, networks and not only in the health sector. Um, and then, of course, um, well, as a network, we try to, to, to bundle forces uh, to also give policy advice to, to influence uh, at a higher level. Uh, we work directly with the, uh, the Belgian government on development cooperation. So there again, I think all the different inputs from the members and uh, the experiences we, uh, we have all together can, uh, can, can uh, bring an uh, important input in this uh, uh, policy dialogue. And to finish, because this is of course only the first reflections, and uh, I am not, uh, I am not because health. I think there will be a lot, a lot of, of reflection and, and discussion following this conference. Uh, these are only my first reflections uh, after having uh, followed the, the sessions in the conference. But what was also I wanted to respond to, to after the the speech of, of Mike Ryan, I think. The first thing as a, as a network of organizations and individuals that fight for the right to help is to stay on our focus on to not uh, lose track of the, the, the primary objective, which is to have strong health systems. Because um, if, if we do not have basic healthcare services accessible to the people at uh, a price they can pay and uh, at a good quality so uh, people uh, actually get cured and can have trust in the in the in the system um, if if people don't have access to healthcare they cannot start thinking about all the other challenges it's not it's like not having access to food shelter uh, and and uh, the basic needs in in life if you do not have health or if you have the continuous uh, stress or that your children, that your family uh, do, do, does not have access to, uh, to health services, it's very difficult, I think, to start really contributing uh, to, uh, to, to responding to all the other challenges. So I would okay. uh, finish by saying that let's, as, as health actors, uh, do all these other things, unite, but also uh, continue defending uh, the 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 important message that we first need to focus on strong health system. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Elise. At least a, a lot of uh, a lot of food for thought and and on the plate of of the the emerging working group, I would say around climate change. Uh, well, looking at this fine seminar and the collaborative effort to to make it happen, uh, it's already a good start of of such a working group, I would guess. Uh, and uh, it's only the end of the of the beginning, as we say. Um, Yes, well, uh, time is not with us, but I think uh, we, we still have a very important voice of, of Virginia, who is a strong advocate, and uh, we already heard her uh, today. Please, uh, hearing all this, Virginia, what are your, your final words eh, on, on, on this panel? What would be your, in, in, a, in a short way, the, the, the things you want to inspire us with? Please go ahead. Yes, uh, in the Philippines, we are now experiencing the effects of climate change. But we have also to grapple with the present health system that we need to change because apparently this is not helping us at all. And so I feel that for all the sharing that I have heard today, I don't think that the COP or other climate negotiations will truly help us concretely because we need it now. It is an immediate need and we need answers now, especially in countries being ravaged by typhoons, heat waves, rising sea levels. We need actions now. And so we need to really have a parallel body or group who will try to convince and educate everyone 
regarding climate change and how this is already an emergency. And based on the sharing, especially of our youth, the disabled, and other networks present in this body now, I feel and I think that we should not rely on COP or other negotiations dominated by the polluters themselves. And we have to take actions now. And so it is my call for us first to empower the victims and the most affected and give them a chance to hear their voice and also ask the others to amplify our voices also because our problems, especially in the third world, are very intense and long-standing already that has rendered us so vulnerable and now there's climate change. So perhaps uh, I would not make this quite long anymore as so many things have been said. Let us help each other. Climate change is real. Climate change will soon affect us all. And presently it is already ravaging my country. So perhaps we can really plan something in order that we can convince uh, polluter countries to stop the greenhouse gas emissions and help those who are presently in need of aid, especially with regards to the health systems that we have to grapple with every day, the vilification, the red tagging, and the repression and oppression that we experience that all render us more vulnerable to climate change. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity that I'm able to say this now in behalf of my countrymen. I am so happy that Because Health, the Viva Salud, the MMI, all gave us opportunities to be able to talk and say this to all of you now. And I just hope that after this conference, we can have concrete actions and we are ready to take part in these concrete actions. But first of all, please be our voice in all avenues. While we do our work here at the local level, we try to uh, lobby for legislation. We try to uh, lobby for ordinances that will protect us from the hazards of climate change. And we also are facing elections of a new administration by 2022 actually have already given up on this present administration for any actions that will render us less vulnerable. But we hope that our people's organizations and the manner in which we try to empower even little by little, the most affected victims of climate change will enable us to do some actions collectively and, be, and serve as strength for future generations to come. So that's all that I can say. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful opportunity for me and I can't wait to go back to the community and tell them about this initiative of this conference. And I hope to see you again soon and perhaps uh, we can do collaborative work on climate change adaptation and hopefully uh, on health which is also one of our um, immediate concerns right now, the COVID pandemic and the very poor healthcare system that we currently experience. Thank you so much, that's all. Thank you very much, Virginia Talents. It's a real pleasure uh, to listen to you and we hope that the empowerment of those two days, Climate Justice and Health Equity Conference are really reinforcing every organization that is connected with uh, Because Health. Uh, thank you, Carol, El, uh, Elise, Adelaide, uh, Karim Elham and uh, Virginia uh, for this uh, last debate.